Happy Sunday, everybody. We are so glad and honored that you are joining us this morning for Lifehouse Church Online. We would love to know who's joining us and where you're watching from. Say hello in the chat section of whatever platform you're watching on and check in with your church family. We want to take a moment before we dive into service to welcome those of you who might be joining us for the first time. We want to be the first to say, welcome home. We know that visiting a church or finding a church home can be a little intimidating, especially if you just moved to the Hampton Roads area or you haven't been to church in a while. But regardless of how you found us, we pray that the service is a blessing to you. If you're local here in the Hampton Roads, we would love to have you come in and visit us in person at the Kiln Creek Regal Theater next Sunday. We have two identical services at 9 or 10.45 a.m. You can go to lifehouseonline.church for more information. If it is your first time joining Lifehouse today, we would love to connect with you and send you a gift card as a small way to say thank you. You should see a link to our digital connection card in the chat box of whatever platform you're watching on. Please go to that link sometime before the service ends today and fill that out. We promise we won't try to sell you anything or bombard you with information. We just want to say thank you. And whether it's your first time joining us today or Lifehouse is home, we want to remind you of the vision of Lifehouse. Lifehouse exists to invite everybody to live an uncommon life by following Jesus, being a disciple, doing life together, being in community, getting in the game, being equipped to serve, and leaving a legacy, being a steward. And part of leaving a legacy involves our Forest City Initiative, and we want to tell you all about that. What well, we have coming up, so Pastor John and Carrie, take it away. Lifehouse family, it's Pastor John and Pastor Carrie Jones here, and we are excited that it is almost August, and that means we will be showering our communities with love through service during our For Our Cities week. This year, we have 17 projects and over 450 volunteer opportunities. We'll be starting on July 30th, building 53 beds for kids oh, that don't right. have a bed to sleep in and having a block party in the Aqueduct community, partnering with Mana and City Life Churches. On July 31st, we will be canceling church services to go out into the community to perform projects with the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Newport News Public School System. And we're gonna keep it going through the next week. We have several projects, including an American Red Cross blood drive, Habitat for Humanity projects, and food bank packing and sorting. And we will be closing for our city's week with a back to school party and school supply giveaway on August 5th. If you call Lifehouse your home church, we need you and want you to get in the game and sign up for one or more of these events. You can sign up at the link below or by scanning a QR code if you're in the lobby. It is because of you and your generous giving of your time, your talent, and your treasure that allow us to show that we are for our city. Thank you in advance for financially investing into the vision of Lifehouse and for our city. The ways to give are in the chat section. And one more thing before we go to today's message. If you are part of Lifehouse family and haven't participated in Lifetrack yet, let me encourage you to do that. Lifetrack is a process that we have created to help make Lifehouse your home. By knowing our vision, values, church structure, what we believe the Bible teaches, and so much more. It is the next best step for those who want to make Lifehouse home. And you can complete it 100% online by going to lifehouselifetrack.com. But let's get into today's message. Today we have a special guest with us, Pastor Brandon Shank from Palms Church in Virginia Beach. He's better known as Uncle Brandon around here at Lifehouse, and he will be continuing our series, It Is What It Is. Let's go live to the Kiln Creek Regal Theater. If you've not signed up for a project, make sure you do that this week so we can get a good count of what we have going on. Also, too, right now, we want to welcome all of those joining us online. Lifehouse here at Regal. Can we welcome all of those joining us online right now. We're so glad that you are here with us, but here's the thing, right? Forest City would not be possible without your generosity. We were able to cut a check a couple weeks back for $15,000 to get these beds built, to get all of the materials built. So thank you so much. If you want to give today and so into and really invest in what God is doing here at Lifehouse, the ways to give right are on the screen behind me. Many of you give faithfully online and we thank you for that. Your giving is making a tremendous difference in hundreds of people's lives each week. And we thank you and we are just so, so grateful for that. But today we are excited to have my good friend, brother, pastor, uncle, 
Uh, Brandon Shank with us today from Palms Church in Virginia Beach and an incredible church church there. Brandon, go ahead and come on up, up, man. Let's go ahead and give it up for him as he comes up today. And Brandon, I just, I just want to thank you, brother, for just being an incredible friend, for being an incredible leader, for being an incredible pastor, and just a voice to this generation. And if you know Brandon, you love Brandon, I, I mean, honestly, there are a lot of passionate guys. Um, but I have yet to meet like one person that is as passionate as Brandon is about anything. Like he could sell ice. You, you know what that slogan is? He could sell ice to what? Eskimos? Like, like, like Brandon. But, but the thing is, right, it, it's not BS. Like Brandon lives what he, what, what he teaches. He lives what he preaches. Just as passionate as he is up here preaching, he's just as passionate with his wife and with his kids and with his family behind the scenes. And that is what I appreciate about him. And I'm excited to have him come today and invest in our church. And I just want you one more time, give it up as Brandon comes and brings God's word today. I love you, brother. Thank I'm thankful you, for you. And, hey, bro, I'm looking forward to you just just overflowing with the Holy Spirit. I appreciate our church, it, man. man. Love you, bro. Love you, bro. Appreciate you, man. Uh, yeah, man. Come on, give it up for your lead pastors, Pastor John and Kristen. Come on, can you get on your feet and thank your pastors for birthing such an incredible church? Nobody understands unless they've been there. Come on, like you mean it, like your life has been saved and depends on it. Come on, somebody. Come on, give them a shout like you know you've been redeemed. So grateful, so grateful for you, Pastor John and Kristen. Y'all may be seated, but uh, as a pastor, I can tell you, um, it, staff is amazing. You are amazing, but there's nothing like being the guy that uh, is that. Uh, everybody says, well, you're like God. I say, no, I'm just an elf. Uh, I'm just a messenger. Uh, I, don't, I don't make the decisions, but carrying the weight of a church. Pastor John and Kristen have done such a beautiful job. And I love coming back here because I get to see um, the birth of something that I knew was just a dream. You know, so every time I come back, every one of you are a byproduct of a dream dream that Pastor John had when he was at, uh, when we were formerly Lifehouse Virginia Beach years ago, and he came in, he said, whatever you need, man, I'm here. I said, all right, well, let's go. Let's run 100 miles an hour, and uh, he has done that, and uh, he and Kristen, um, there's only a small percentage of pastors who've pastored through COVID and still standing, you know, that a, a small percentage of pastors on this planet that have pastored through such a thing, or ever, uh, and so just um, so, so grateful for you and this church and, and all you're doing. But there's also one more person I want to introduce. I've got four boys. My oldest is Caden, 11. Then I've got Ryland, who is nine. I've got Makai, who is seven, and Asher, who is five. Um, and uh, my 11-year-old is with me today. So y'all make some noise for Caden. Welcome here to LifeHouse. So grateful he could be with me. Uh, all-world baseball player, uh, athlete connoisseur, passionate little guy. Uh, love him with all of my heart. Um, and... Um, I'm just grateful that he could be with me today. It's cool as a dad being able to bring your kids to do the things that, you know, um, you get to do, you know, and that they fall in love with Jesus. And um, so grateful for you, man. I love you, buddy, uh, with all my heart. How many of you love being wrong? Anybody in here love being wrong? You're like, man, I just, I don't mind. I like being wrong every now and then. I mean, or how many of you like it when you're corrected by your kids and they're right? Because <laughs> you're thinking, well, this undermines the entire authoritative structure within my home. Because now if they're right, uh, then I, I'm going to have to explain why the things that I say that are right are right when they don't think they're right. You know, I don't know about you, but I hate, I hate being wrong. And it's my pride. I get it. I'm not apologizing for that. I'm saying I'm a work in progress. But I don't like when I'm wrong and they're right, or even not my kid, my wife, coworkers, friends. And then the, the thing, oh, yeah, you, you're right about that. But it's hard to say, oh, yeah, I was wrong. Right? You can say you were right. Really hard to say that you were wrong. We just got back from two weeks. We were on the road. My uh, nine-year-old played in the 10U Little League State champion, state Tournament, and then Caden played uh, my 11-year-old in the uh, 11U State Tournament. And so we went from Lynchburg to Virginia for a whole week and drove up to D.C. for another week for two different tournaments. And we have an RV, so we're RVers, man. So we were just on the road doing our thing. Um, but when we got to the 11U Tournament, we'd already been on the road for about eight, ten days. And uh, the, the way, when you get up towards D.C., where this tournament was, there wasn't a lot of places close to it that was, you could park an RV. We found a place about 20 minutes away. It was a state park. Now, any, any, any RVers in here? Anybody? Okay. This is going to be a tough, tough illustration. But I'm going to help you understand something. State parks aren't level, right? And another part about state parks is that, uh, you know, the... The, the standard for RV, um, I know Rob Crumb's watching from somewhere. Rob and Patty, I love you guys. <laughs> I've known Rob and Patty for a long time. But uh, the, the thing about an RV is that you get sewage, water, and electric. Those are three things you want 
when you park your RV. Now, you can go without sewage because you can just, you know, there's like dump sites on the way out of our campgrounds. It sounds a lot more uh, difficult than it really is. But this particular RV place, we were in northern Virginia. We were in D.C. And the reason I tell you all these details is because I hate being told a story without the details, right? So I'm a detail guy. So just ride with me. Here we go. So we're in this RV park and this state park, and they said, well, hey, we have a full hookup for three days, but then we have a hookup with only water and electric for the next three, which means, you know, you might have to use the, the shower house. And that's okay. You know, I let my wife use the camper, me and the boys use the shower house. But in order to do that, I knew I was going to have to get some shower shoes because I didn't want no massive warts on my feet that I didn't know where they came from when I get back to Virginia Beach, right? Uh, and so uh, we were on our way to the store. We're going to dinner one night. And uh, we're driving, and I'm telling my wife, these are the two things I got to get from the store when we get there. So we get to the store, I look back, I look at my wife, I don't remember what I was getting. I remember the one thing. How many of y'all have those moments? You're like, I don't know, from the directions, and my phone ringing, and kids talking, and my wife looking at me with that beautiful look in her eye. I just don't remember what I was doing with my life. I don't remember where I was going, how I was getting there, and what I was getting when I got there. Anybody with me? Moms, dads, parents, all right. Okay, we got a clap on that one, which means some of y'all, yeah. No, I say we got a clap. Somebody was already clapping, saying, I need deliverance. Help my mind to be pure. A little bit of Starbucks can go a long way, right? A little bit of coffee. Uh, but we get there, and I looked at my wife and said, I don't remember what I was getting. And I remembered it was something crucial, uh, and I didn't realize at the moment that it would be the betterment of my health in the long term, a.k.a. not having warts on my feet. I'm needing shower shoes. And my five-year-old pipes up. He said, Dad, you need shower shoes. And I'm thinking... This is the first of many times that as a parent I'm going to experience needing my child's help to fulfill what it was I was trying to do in my life. It was a moment for me because my youngest child just told me the exact reason, and my wife looks at me, and she's like, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant, brilliant kid. My wife looks at me, and I'm thinking, this is the beginning. I got an 11-year-old now, so in the next two or three years, probably not going to know much, right, as a parent. I don't have a teenager yet, but I heard it's coming. And so I'm not going to know much, but the reality of it is your kids are getting smarter, right? And there's more conversations, and those discipline moments turn into teaching moments more so, from what I'm understanding. But I know for me, and just like you, I don't really like to be wrong. I, I like to kind of be the one who makes the rules. I set the rules, and I give the discipline when the rules are not followed. I don't like to be corrected and have to be wrong. Now, uh, I think for all of us, if we're being honest, we can say we've looked back at a decision in our life, something that was difficult, and realized it was really just hard because of our pride. It wasn't hard because the decision was hard. In fact, it wasn't hard because the situation was hard. It was hard because of the way we had a hard wire for our pride inside, right? Now, everybody hates these conversations because all of us love pride, and we hate humility. But the reality of it is um, we all want the byproduct of humility, but none of us want to live in the humility that it takes to get that. Hey, nobody does. It's, it's human nature. It's kind of how we're wired. All of our fights, quarrels, arguments, gossip, backbiting, they're all raindrops. Those things are all just byproducts of a cloud called pride. That's all they are. In fact, this, this particular passage that we're reading, uh, James is the brother of Jesus. And the reason this is so interesting is because James didn't come on the scene until he saw his brother resurrect from the dead. That'll do it to you. Right? James was a, he saw that. Now, you know, James growing up was like, oh, there goes Jesus again. Yeah, he's walking on water. He's cool. He's cool, right? James is the one who had to have a lifeguard come save him, and Jesus is walking on, on water. And so James is his brother that all of a sudden you, you can't help. If no, there's no other, uh, there is proof in the resurrection because of my life has changed, right? But there's no, if there's no other proof that a scientist, a scientist wants, then read James because James, you don't hear about him until after Jesus was resurrected. And so why the brother of Jesus all of a sudden comes on the scene? Because he is proof of the resurrection. He is proof that something's real. You don't give your life for something that's not real. And so what James is trying to tell us is he's speaking to this early church, and I know you might have heard some background in the last couple of weeks, but let me reiterate for those of you who maybe are new to this series or even new here to LifeHouse today. This series is really circled around uh, somebody who was passionate about God, who knew Jesus, and he was trying to help the Jews, the early Christians, understand what it was like. These are the basic principles you got to do right because they will take and guide your life in a way that nothing else will. And so he's trying to help us see things that maybe we don't always see. He grew up in the same house, he possessed this passion, he saw his brother resurrect from the dead, and he was a witness of what many denied. And he's teaching us in this passage how to live a life above the level of pride. He's trying to show the church that you lived, you're, you're serving God for the advancement of yourself, and the purpose of the church is to live for the advancement of Christ. It sounds like something we've heard a million times, but it's hard to apply this. Can we be honest? It's hard to apply this. I, I don't like it when I don't, I don't like it when somebody that I don't prefer corrects me, and they're right. Now, I'm not talking about my children. I'm talking about that coworker who just gets on my nerves, right? And then you realize, oh, they're right. You're like, no, they ain't right. I will, I will fight to the finish that they are wrong because of the fact I will not 
give up my pride. Well, let's read James chapter four, verse one together. And this is what he says to him. He starts with a question. He says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Do they not come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous. Everybody say jealous. Even saying that word feels dirty, doesn't it? You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. That makes jealousy even worse. When you can't get what you want, and you know what you want because somebody else has what you want. You don't even know if you want it, but you know they have it, and that makes you want to want it, right? He says, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. You see, you don't fight and wage war to get it. You fight and wage war to take it. There's a difference. That's the jealous heart. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. Everybody say, it's all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Now, this is what we call civil war. It's your flesh versus your spirit. It's waging within you. It's the same body, the same country, the same place, and there's, there's two things waging. There's a good and evil. There's the flesh and what you want and the spirit and what God actually desires for your life. The only way your needs will be met is through God. Repeat this after me. The only way my needs will be met, met, met is through God. Oh, come on, somebody. Can you celebrate like you have freedom in your life and that there's a God who is restored and redeemed and rewarded you at some point in your life? Can somebody please celebrate the fact they have a Savior who has met needs? You see, we lose, we lose track of this. I love what Psalm 37 says. It's a verse that many of us have used in a long, wrong way, and many of us have used as a help in the times that we need it. And it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, this doesn't mean delight yourself in God and you're getting that Maserati. No, what it's saying is that might be God's desire, but you only have those things if it's your desire, which means your desires are in God. When your desires are in God, then his desires become yours, and then the things that you get are the things that you wanted because they were his desires not the things that you wanted. Does this make sense to you? It's a very simple concept, but it's hard to live. The reality is that to delight delight means to take pleasure in. What if we took pleasure in God and we didn't use him as a hybrid to get to heaven? We actually took pleasure in who he was. Delight is an action. And the reality is this, what James is trying to tell us and what Psalms is reiterating is that God's desires in us follow our desire for him. You can't, it doesn't go backwards. You're not going to have these amazing desires from God unless you have a desire for God that starts the whole thing. Have you guys ever, have you ever been hungry and you thought of a delicious meal and then you felt full? You're like, man, oh, I'm so hungry right now. I'll tell you one thing, and I don't know why it is, whether I'm in a fast or I'm just Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock and I'm ready to eat or whatever it may be. Have you ever just, you have a food that you think of that's it's your go-to no matter what. It's just that food you think of every time that you're hungry. I have one. It's not healthy and it's not even something I get maybe once a year, but it's the cheese fries from Outback. And I don't know why it is, and it's not, I don't even eat it Outback that often, but it's the cheese fries, the way they do their bacon and their cheese, and that beautiful dipping sauce that comes straight from heaven. You know, I don't know what it is, but when I'm starving, I just think of that every time. It doesn't matter if it's January or July. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, but when I think of that, I can almost taste it. You can smell it, right? Every sense except for taste is working, you feel like, in that moment. But I can tell you this. How many times have you thought about that steak that you want to cut into or that burger that you want to enjoy or for some of you that brought broccoli, quinoa, and nice slice of chicken. Yeah, y'all laugh because nobody's thinking about that when you're hungry, right? You think about that to get past hunger, but you don't think about that when you are hungry. But how many of you think about those things that you like to eat and it nourishes you and you're like, "Mm, that was a good meal. I'm glad that right now in the middle of this service in July, I stopped to have some cheese fries while Brandon was talking because I feel full. I'm good. I cannot wait to get done with this. I'm going to go run some errands. Don't even need lunch. I'm full. That's crazy, right? Why? Because nourishment doesn't come from the memories, right? The nourishment can't come from what used to be. The nourishment can't come. Replenishment is not something that comes from. Nourishment from our memory is not how it works. The nourishment in your life is going to come from current experience. It can't come from memories of what God did. It can't come from miracles that once happened long ago. That's not the way that it works. You're saying, well, how do we do this? How How do I make this happen? The way you make it happen is you have to desire God's nourishment. You have to desire to actually eat from what he's providing in your life, and his desires will then nourish you. And so what it means is coming off of those things that you think you've achieved or the things that you think you've earned or the things that you think that you have a right to, and you have to lower your pride and realize that maybe that promotion wasn't what God was saying, but it was what your pride was saying, and that's why you took it, and you're miserable, and you're thinking, well, I've just been miserable ever since. I have no time with my family. I have no time with the kids. I have no time with the things that I enjoy, and I'm not excited, but this is a good 10-year plan. So you're telling me you're willing to take 10 years of your life and push it off because of a desire that you have when God hasn't asked that of you. 
You have no idea what he can do with your finances when you give it to him. And that's what James is trying to tell us. He's saying, what wages this war within you? James understands. James knows the answer. It's rhetorical in a sense. And then he goes on in verse 4, and he says, you adulterers. And he's not trying to throw down on them. He's trying to help them understand where they're at. He says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And now he's not saying you can't have friends that are in the world. What he's trying to say is you are living your life like you are the world and not like your people who desire what God has for your life. You know, I read an article the other day on, on finances and how to retire with a million dollars when you're young. And I can tell you, I was bored. I get so sick and tired of the financial peace in the local church. Do I think it works? Sure, it's great. I'm not saying there's anything against it. But where in the Bible has God asked us to store up a nest egg for a rainy day when there's people around us who are dying and hurting? I get sick of it, man. It drives me crazy. It's not that I don't think those things are good, but I can tell you this. When you save, it's not that, well, I'm a good steward, and I've heard all the scriptures, but what I'm trying to help you understand is it's not about the scriptures and whether I save. God doesn't speak on my, you know what, God's, the roads in heaven are made of gold. That gives you a little bit of context of what God thinks of our money. Like, God is trying to say, I want you to be a good steward of what I've given you, and I can multiply it. If you save, I can only add to your life. Now, is the savings good? Yes. And I'm not trying to get off task. What I'm trying to tell you is a lot of times our desires are driven by money. Our desires are driven by success, the worldly desires, right? Is it good to have, uh, too good to have money? If God provides it, people can look at my life, and it doesn't all add up, and that's okay. Because I want them to know, well, I didn't add to my life. God multiplied my life. I don't ever want to get into a place where I run a nonprofit that has so much profit we don't know what to do with all of it. I want to be in a place where we're constantly going bankrupt for the things of God and challenging and saying, God, do it again. God, do it again. I'm going to give you back because then you can multiply it. Every time God's given me vision for our church, he has said, put it all in the middle of the table and I will multiply what you've given. And we've done it. And it times into a deficit. When we launched the campus in 2019, we had zero dollars eight months out. We had zero dollars one month out. But we had hundreds of dream teamers ready to launch the campus. Two weeks before we had to launch the campus, over hundred thousand dollars came in and we had everything we needed for that campus why because only god that's the story of the you 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 can choose in your life to be a friend with the world or to be a friend of god and i promise you it determines where your money's going it determines how you're how you're shifting your agenda it determines how you're living your life and it says if you want to be a friend of the world then make yourself an enemy of god do you think the scriptures have no meaning they say that god is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him and he gives grace generously as the scriptures say god opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble now it's important you understand what opposes mean this is actually a military term in scripture used to mean to push against to resist so it doesn't say god just lets it go and you kind of fall into your own stuff it's saying god actually resists now you're thinking that's not a very nice god why would you resist me God. And God is saying, because I know that it's going to save your life if I do. It's not because he's a bully. He's saying, I'm pushing against. So have you ever thought in your life you've tried so hard for things that just aren't working out? Maybe we should step back and not think it's the devil fighting against us, but God pushing against us. Maybe we should realize the resistance when you're a Christian. There's nothing in that that shows me, well, I'm just, I, I think as Christians, we use a lot of terms to try to classify our struggle. When a lot of times it's that we're doing something God's not asked us to do and we're facing fights that he hasn't asked us to fight, but yet we classify it as a Satan pushing against us because we're doing something that we want to do, but yet we're saying in the name of Jesus, make it happen. Anything God's asked me to do, nothing's ever been easy, but I've never had to micromanage the process to get where God's going. He's always been in front of it. And this is really what James is trying to help us to see. When you feel like you can't get ahead and things are pushing against you, it, they, probably, they probably are. I would give up everything in my life, my car, my house, RV, not my wife and kids, but everything else. I would give up everything in, a, in an instant. It, it doesn't matter to me. Why? Because I know what it's like to live in a place where God hasn't asked me to be. I know what it's like to live in moments where God hasn't asked me to do that. In 2011, I didn't want to pastor or plant a church, and it wasn't because I didn't think this is the best, this is the best thing in the world I could ever do with my time, my money, my energy. I can't imagine doing anything but shepherding God's people. It's the greatest honor. It's the greatest reward. But at the time, I had so much hurt from other things in my life that I didn't want to go into the local church to pastor because I, I was scared of it. I didn't let God, I was taking the desires he's put in my heart and trying to make them come to pass on my own. So I worked at a five-star restaurant, and this one particular day, I was fasting. Isn't it ever funny that you fast for things God's already told you? You know, you'll, you'll, God, God told me in 2019 when he said, build that campus. I said, all right. I'm gonna, I, in the middle of the night, he gave me that vision, eight months out. So the next morning, I woke up, and I told my wife, I'm gonna fast and pray, take a week and just fast and pray. And God said, Why? I already told you what to do. Why are you fasting and praying? 
You ever find that we do that when we don't like the answer? We're, we're going to stand still, and we put ourselves in that standstill, and God is saying, get out of it by just pulling back, and we're saying, well, I'm going to fast and pray for your movement. And he's like, I already did. You're, now you're just starving because you're not asking me for what I want. You're just asking me for what you want for me to help you with that. Well, in 2011, I was in that position. I was working at a five-star restaurant. I was a valet because I wanted to drive the nice cars. I didn't want to wait tables. I just wanted to drive the nice cars. And so I was valeting, and this one particular day, we had a catered event, and it was the owner of the restaurant amongst some of the creative people and marketing people that had flown down from New York City. And I was fasting lunch that day. They fed us meals, but that day I decided I'm going to fast lunch because I'm going to get God to move in my life. I'm going to get him to show me the great things. Meanwhile, he already told me to plant the church, but that wasn't important at the time because I was going to fast for other things, right? So the manager comes out to me, and he says, hey, can you help me with this catered lunch? I said, sure. He said, all right, I need you to come down to this house, and we're going to start clearing it up and bring it back up to the kitchen. So, all right, that sounds good, man. And I mean, the stuff that was on this menu, I could, probably couldn't pronounce uh, respectively. For those of you who are chefs, you would understand it. For the rest of us, it would just sound like really expensive food, and we would probably not want to eat it, you know, because my, it might even have some gold flakes in it, for all I know. I, I have no idea. People that eat rich food do weird things, right? truffles i think they taste awful but they're really expensive so i went down and i and my my manager was there and he's and i walked into this kitchen and it was more food in a massive kitchen you've ever seen in your life and everything looked like it came right out of willy wonka it was beautiful it had all kinds of colors to it it was like this beautiful purple and neon green and pink and he's like oh that's mashed potatoes and you're thinking what you know it's just you don't even know what it is but it looks amazing and i had fasted lunch and i was standing there and god told me he says eat i said what he said eat he says, because if you would do what I'm asking you to do, your life will be fulfilled and greater than anything you've ever imagined. And what I have isn't chicken fingers that you passed up for lunch. It's the greatest. I have five star and above for you in your life, but you got to eat. Do what I'm telling you to do. And I wonder for how many of us we're in a position right now that God's not asked us to be in. This is, this is something I want to help you see. And something James is pleading with the Christians, but something that you've got to see today is that if it's not God's desire, you don't want it. You think you want it. If it's not God's desire, you don't want it. If you're a Christian, there was a point where you wanted God's desire. There was. And I'm not saying, for some of you that today you're listening to this, and you're like, well, I don't really follow God like that. That's okay. I hope this message stirs you to follow him. Because I promise you, life gets better. People say, I just don't know if I want the struggle of being a Christian. Are you kidding me? Have you realized what it's like to not be a Christian? That's why people come to Christ. Because everything's a counterfeit for the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the only thing that's going to fill your life. And what I'm trying to help you see today is if it's not God's desire, you don't want it. If you came to know Christ at some point in your life, there was a level of humility that was going to guide your life with God's direction. Because you said a prayer that it tells us to say in Romans chapter 10, verses 9, and this is what it says, that if you confess, everybody say confess, in your mouth with the Lord and Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So if you have ever come to know Christ, there was a moment where you had a humility about yourself, where you surrendered your life to God. And the continual answer is the second part of chapter 7. This is what God tells Solomon. This is what God tells Solomon. He says, then if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will humble themselves, pray, pray, seek my face, seek my face. So if they're humble, so if they're humble then it means you're going to pray. And if you're praying and you're actually hearing God, it means that at some point you're going to seek him. And then you're, then you're going to turn from the things that, you're, that are called into trouble. And then it says, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will restore their land. Humbled is to be submitted or to bow your knee. It is a physical term right here to Solomon saying, I need people to physically bow because the physical position will show me their spiritual representation. I need people to be humbled before me, and I can do it. But these people, they got to be right. He's the only thing I need from you is humility, man. Because if you have humility, then I, can, then I know you'll be obedient. You know, we live God 30% on, 70% ours, and we wonder why we're not doing what you call us to do. I get this question all the time, what's God calling me to do? I say, I don't know. I ain't God. I say, well, can you help me get there? Yeah, humble yourself, and you'll always be right where he wants you. Every time, humble yourself before him. And your heart will start to turn in ways that you never before imagined. So how do we apply this? You want to tell me? Humble ourselves. You humble yourself. Humility is the only way we live in God's desires and not in our own. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence, and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things.
please him. So you're saying, well, how do I humble myself? John is telling us. He's saying, hey, come to God with bold confidence. Say, I'm a child of the most high. I may not have it all together, but my God does. And when I bow down, he hears me. He sees me. He's going to turn my desires to the things of him. And in Philippians chapter 2, this is a promise. And this is something you need to realize. And what Paul's telling the church at Philippi, it says, for God is working in you. Everybody say you. Now let's make it personal. Say me. For God is working in you, in me, giving you. Say, giving you. Now say, giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, can we read this together? But I want you to say, me. For God is working in me, giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So there's no excuse here. We can't say, well, I just don't know. I'm praying. If I No, you do know. And God is working in you to give you the desires and the ability to do the things he's called you to do, to walk as high as he's called you to walk, as far as he's called you to walk, with the power and the authority and the hands that heal and the feet that will take the gospel to places only you can take and to have the understanding and the passion and the charisma and the peace and the joy and the Holy Spirit anointing. He's given it all, and the only reason we don't have it is because we don't come humbly. Scripture is trying to teach us. James is pleading with the people, these Jews who knew what Judaism was. They knew the times of prayer every day. They believed in God and they knew that their people were taken through the Red Sea and that their people were freed from the promised land and the walls of Jericho that fell. They knew that David slayed ten, tens of thousands and they knew that Solomon built a beautiful temple and they knew the prophets Isaiah and Malachi. They knew all these things, but they were failing to submit to Jesus because they weren't humble. They started to feel better. They started to feel bigger than Have you ever needed a haircut, an oil change? Let's say you need your grass mowed or your house cleaned and you put it off. Anybody ever do that? Can we just confess collectively? Maybe we got more claps on that. So somebody needs a haircut bad. Don't anybody look behind them. Every time I go in my barber, if I'm on vacation, I was on vacation, I'm getting ready to go back on vacation. He was like, bro, you needed a haircut. I was like, I know, man, but nobody sees me. So I just keep the hat on and do my thing. Just break out the weed eater on me, you know, take care of business. He's like, I was wondering when you were going to come in. I was like, yeah, brother, <laughs> been gone. But whenever you finally get that haircut, how many of you, or before you get the haircut, how many of you have been in your house? You're like, I'm so angry my barber has not been here to cut my hair. I can't believe that my hairdresser didn't come in and do her thing or his thing. I can't believe it. Or how many of you have sat in your house and you have just sat there and you were fuming and you were so mad at the landscape company that didn't come mow your grass, even though you never hired one? I can't believe my grass looks like this. I got to bail hay. I'm going to have to sell this to a farm because I can't get this off my property. I cannot believe that they didn't come and mow my grass. Or you get a mechanic. You're like, I cannot believe that mechanic is one mile down the road. He has not stopped by once to ask if my oil needed changed. Right? You're thinking, this is ludicrous. You have a responsibility to make a haircut, be grown, drive yourself to the haircuttery or wherever it is that you go to pay for that cut, to get that cut, and regardless of whether or not it looks, it looks better than it did when you got there. You have a responsibility to make sure that your grass is mowed, and if you're a part of an HOA, you probably have a bigger responsibility. You have a responsibility to make sure that 2027 Maserati has its oil changed so that your investment doesn't go down the drain. You have a responsibility to make sure that 2021 Jetta has its oil changed, and for some of us, that 1997 Toyota Tercel has its oil changed. Right, Pastor John? Six. So my question is, if we're not ludicrous and crazy in our mind when things are falling apart in our life, then why do we get mad at God and irritated with him when things are falling apart in our spiritual life? He's given us the remedy with humility and how to approach him. So my thought is maybe we just don't want the freedom. Maybe we're okay with being slain and having an addiction, and we like sexual addiction. It's sin, right? It's that thing that helped us through our childhood trauma. It's that thing that's always been there for us, even though we don't realize it's just eating at the core of our soul. It's eating at the core of our soul, and it's the very thing that will bring us down. It's just Satan will wait for you to have the most influence before he destroys you publicly. This is why James James is pleading with people. He's trying to get the church to understand that what you don't see now will be your downfall later. The church is young. This is one of the earliest books. James is trying to be very clear, but he's trying to help them see what they cannot see. He's trying to guide them in a direction that they don't see a light on the ground. James is pleading with the people. This isn't a mad, a mad gab and a, a writing of some arrogant thoughts. He is pleading with God's people because he is saying, 
I know what it was like to be where you're at because I didn't believe Jesus my whole life the way that I believe him now. That's why he's coming on the scene in such power and passion and favor. And in the end of this excerpt in, in verse 7, he tells us, he says, so humble yourselves before God. And you're thinking, well, I get it. And you said you can come with confidence in it. God hears me, but how do I do that? And it says, here's some steps for you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And what is James saying? He's saying humble yourselves as repentance. It means to repent to God, to tell him that you are less and he is more and that you ask to forgive you of all the sins in your life and things that have held you back and, and tried to strangle your life out. He's saying resist the devil, which means flee temptation. It means for the love of God, get off the computer after 11 when your family is in bed. You gotta want to beat this thing if you're ever gonna stand up whenever nobody's watching. Stop trying to come to church and worship and, and, and put on the show whenever God doesn't need the show. He needs you to be humble. You know, we fight with pride because we're insecure. Our pride fights because we feel like we have something to prove. Humility is when we know we don't have anything to prove because we're a child of the Most High and we'll never be anything other than what he makes us. Come close to God, which means worship. Wash your hands means withdraw from evil. Wash your hands, purify yourself in the presence of God. It's to purify your hearts. It's an inner purification saying, I'm going to start doing things in my life that are going to help me walk in a purity that I've never understood. Mourn means recognize our immor immortality and to grieve. And then he says again, humble yourself. What James is trying to teach us is a very simple concept. It's God will lift up what we bow down. Over and over and over. The title of today's message is actually, what goes up must come down. Your pride, your arrogance, the thought of yourself, it has to come down if God can use it. And you know, you think, well, I just won't serve God and do my own thing, and you won't. Your life will get destroyed because you just can't live in evil and expect it not to eat at you. It's not the way that it works. I love what humble, humble means to place under, to bring under, but I love what it says in 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, so humble yourselves. Everybody say myself. Under the mighty power. And I love how he didn't say under God, but he said mighty power of God, saying, hey, 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 I know this is hard, but God's mighty, and he's thoughtful, and he's kind, and he's loving, and he's a gentleman, and his spirit is real, and his power goes beyond. He says, under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up. Everybody say, me up! He's going to lift you up in honor. He's going to lift you up in the place that you've dreamt about, the place that you've yearned for, the place that you've thought about. I love Matthew chapter 23, what it says. It says, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Say this with me. Say, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. What it's saying is you don't have to fight for your place in life. You don't have to fight for your place in your family. You don't have to fight for your place with your spouse. You don't have to fight for your place at work. You don't have to fight for your place as a pastor. You don't have to fight for your place in ministry. You can live your life completely dark-sided and have all the skeletons in your closet and act like they're not there, but you're fighting for position so that people see your value. And God is saying, if you're wanting people to see value, you always be disappointed because they never will. They're humans. They can't see the value of what you ever will be because humanity doesn't have the depth that God has. Listen, I'm not, I'm not preaching this because I don't get it. I'm preaching it because I had to live this. Sometimes it's easy just staying off of social media for me because I, I don't like what I see. I feel like I worked harder than that guy. So why does he get that? That's pride, right? Well, I don't know why they're so happy dude cheated on her. Why are they so happy? I don't know. Maybe God restored their marriage. Why, why, why does that guy's church look like it looks? And man, we're out here, we're out here swinging for the fences, man. We ain't nothing like that. And God's like, yeah, you, you don't know what he, you don't know what that church looks like. That's the first two rows. And secondly, you don't know what he's been through. You see what I'm saying? It all is about me. It's nothing about God. It's nothing about, man, let me rejoice. And so what I ask God is help me over my life to rejoice in what you're doing instead of look at it as what you're not doing in me. H have you ever solved a marriage problem without an apology? Maybe you have. You're like, yeah, man, and it was great. Finally. 
But what I can tell you is if you ever solved a problem in your marriage without an apology, someone wasn't seen. Even if they were wrong, someone wasn't seen. Because at some point, you and your spouse, there was grief or hurt or a misconstrued idea. There was something that wasn't at the same place. It wasn't healthy, right? And what I've learned is even when my wife is completely wrong, or I'm completely wrong, that at the end of the day, I look at her and say, hey, Case, I, I'm sorry if I said anything to offend you or if I said anything out of my pride or I just, I'm sorry. I could be right. And she's like, oh, yeah, my bad. I was like, well, me too. I, I hope it didn't come, I'll say, I hope it didn't come across like I was being a jerk or trying to, I, I'm sorry, I, I repent. Like, I don't want to be that. Because I always want to make sure she knows I see her. Not because it's a show, but because she matters and I love her and I want that intimacy within us to grow. So why do we struggle with repentance so much? God is saying, be humble. It means you have to repent and say what you're not and what he is. It doesn't mean you tear yourself down. Just use that repent and say, God, you are great. You are my savior and my reward. You're the answer. Humility starts with repentance. See, it's easy to get pride and confidence confused. We agree on that? Unless you understand humility. Pride says it's me and confidence says it's God in me. We want so many things and it can be exhausting trying to figure out what's God and what's from us. But unless we walk in humility, we fight, scrap, beg, borrow, steal, undercut, backbite, gossip, and swindle to get what we want. But when it's God, we draw close to him. And he'll give us his desires and what we never really knew we wanted. You see, being nasty to one another, tearing people apart, tearing those around us, critical spirits, harsh words, slander, they're not the norm. They're not the norm. They're not the norm for those who place God as first in our lives. They're not. They're just not. The civil war that wages in all of us isn't, it's not going to cease. It's not going to surrender. It's not going to be won. It's not. It's not going to be won once and for all. No, the victory is when God's desires are our desires. You're here. You're flesh. But the victory is whenever you're desiring for your life what is Him. And instead of trying to figure out what your life looks like, you're trying to put all your effort into knowing who He is. When He's our main focus and the spotlight and our first desire, everything changes. See, the, the issues are the quarreling and the worldliness, and, but the cloud is pride. Say, God, I just submit myself to you. I submit myself fully. God's desires in us follow our desire for him, and if it's not God's desire, you don't want it, and I promise you, God will lift up what we bow down in our life. So how do I know if there's humility in me? It's a good question, right? I tell you, the, one of the top ways is the byproduct of humility is how we treat people. It's how you treat others. It's when you're talking with your close buddies or your close confidants saying, oh man, he just don't know, or these people are crazy, or that stupid guy, can you believe what he did? Can you believe what he said? No, no, it's how you treat people. The only way to humility, though, is through repentance. It's a tough message. I know I'm a sports guy, and... Um, passionate about sports, coach sports, love sports. But what I can tell you, I've coached against some great coaches, and some of them can be pretty cocky. But when you really get to know guys, they're really not cocky. They're just insecure. You say, well, they're just covering. Oh, yeah, all pride is is cover up for insecurity, man. That's all it is. It's a cover up to not let people get too close. Who knows what they've been through? Who knows what what life situations they've actually, actually endured? 1 John 3, 3 says, and all who have this eager expectation, talking about seeing God and living for God, will keep themselves pure just as he's pure. If you believe God and you want to see God, pure is an unadulterated form. It's a, unadulterated from any other substance saying, I desire for God so much. You know what happens with people that get a lot of pride is they, you, you see them and you see them six months later and you see them a year later and you see some of their, the morals have tilted a tiny bit. You see them a little longer and some of the morals have tilted a just a little bit more. And what it is, is it's not that they're just turning into an awful person because they're struggling with pride. It's that their heart's just slowly moving away from God. The standards are changing, right? 
I love what Corinthians or Second Corinthians tells us. It talks about the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience, and it says specifically, worldly sorrow lacks repentance, and it results in spiritual death. But godly sorrow, it results in salvation. It's this this place, and I think for some of us, we're we're sorry we got caught. We're sorry that our life looks like that. But sorrow is saying, God, I surrender to you. And I repent because I'm a sinner, but I rejoice today because you are the savior of the world. You are the king of all kings. And today I humbly submit myself. I bow down and I repent of anything in my life. But God, I don't want to walk in humility because, or and walk in, in, in pride. I want to walk in humility. I want to humble myself before you because this is the truth. Pride is really, really, really tough to walk in all the time. Always got a chip. You're always ready to fight. You're always ready to get angry. And what James is saying is all these things are falling apart in your life because you've lost the, the repentance with God that has placed you in the very foot of your Savior that lets you live in a way that only he can take you. So I'm asking you today, will you choose today to start living a daily life of just repentance? Start there. Don't tell God everything you're not. Say, God, I surrender today. I choose Will you stand with me this morning? I'm the worship team. Go ahead and come back. You know what? Last summer, I was traveling for about two weeks in August, and I was preaching. I was out in Missouri, and I got back from Missouri, and our church had changed a lot in the year. You know, at the end of COVID, we, went, we were online for a full year, and it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to our church. It was beautiful in the way that we just came together, and we got to do ministry, and it was just very different, but it really built another campus for us in our online, and, it, and it's something that we are passionate about. We always say we're an online church with a physical location because you can get to people's pockets all over the world, right? And so it's a passion for us. But coming back last August, we had been, uh, I guess you could say, uh, in person for probably six or seven months. I felt God switching uh, really my heart and uh, kind of how he had wired me to pastor the church for the first six years of the time. And he said, from here on out, you're just, you're gonna, I just want you to preach the gospel. And now for any pastor that that's the, really their DNA, it's exciting because you're like, man, I get to preach, give vision, and lead. And you're thinking, oh, that happens like 20 years in. But God said, no, no, I want you to preach the gospel, and it's going to change everything. And it took a lot of humility because somebody who likes to be an organizational leader, I like my hands in different pots. I like to help make decisions for creative. I like to help make decisions for certain things that we're doing on the prayer team. But what God said is they can do it better because I've equipped them. But what I need from you in order to do what I need through the word, I need you to lock in in a different place than you've ever locked in to preach in the gospel. Now, so every day, I would go work out in the, in the morning in my garage, and then August, after I got home, I would be sweating, I would feel like dying, I would hope I was dying at times, I felt old, I felt overweight, I felt all these things that you feel when you're about 40, and I hit my, my knees, and I would lift my hands, and every day I would say, God, every day I did this, I'm the servant, you're the master, I surrender, I surrender, God. It wasn't a prayer, I don't know what you're doing, but I choose to have faith. Who cares if you know what he's doing? He parts seas and builds arcs. It's good if you don't know what he's doing. Say, God, I, I'm the servant, but you're the master. Just use me in whatever way you see fit to reach people with the message of who you are and what your son did for us. God, I, I will preach your gospel with the fullness of what is inside of me. And I will come to you to hear the words and to surrender and to make sure everything that is said is what the scripture is intended for it to say. Help me to preach your gospel with tenacity and with humility in a newfound place that I can take people further and I can teach them deeper and I can love them in a more holistic way. I pray that prayer every day through the end of the year. Get on my knees. God, I'm the servant. You're the master. And it was a subtle reminder bow down. He doesn't need you to fulfill it. He needs you to be available for it. And he's including you in his plan. Submit. And things have blossomed in ways that I can't explain. Why? Because I chose to fill a lane and not to be the answer for the whole thing. So God, you're the would you just close your eyes? Take one moment and just lift your hands with me this morning.
if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to say this maybe for the first time in your life. But as a family, can we pray with those today that are praying this prayer? Can we say, dear Jesus, I repent. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he died for me. Today I surrender. I give you my life, my heart, my motives, and my dreams. I am the servant. You are my master. I fully surrender. In Jesus' name. Just your hands raised. Would you just stay there for a moment? For some of you, this is a moment that you need because I feel right now that some of you are just empty. You feel so overwhelmed and just you just need a touch from your Father. And I'm telling you, He's here, He sees you, and He loves you. You're not going unnoticed. We are your servants. Holy Spirit, fill these vessels. Help us not to settle for counterfeits and false alarms, but fill us today with the fullness of who you are. Would you just take 30 seconds in prayer, prayer to God on your own? Would you just say his name, Jesus? Fill us today, Jesus. It's the most powerful name. It's not just a word. It's, a, it's an action in the name of Jesus. It's an awe-inspiring name of Jesus. Come on, we're going to sing this together. I want you just to take a moment and just worship out of this this morning. Worship out of this message. There's no reason for an ending. This is a worship moment where you surrender. Lifehouse, let's take some time and respond to God's word and worship through singing. During worship, feel free to encourage others in the chat. And most importantly, if you feel led, let us know what God is speaking to your heart during this song. Let's worship together, Lifehouse.
that today's service blessed and impacted you whether you say yes to following jesus would like to get to know others through being part of a life group want to start getting in the game through serving or start being a good steward of your resources through financially giving towards the vision of lifehouse we want to help you take that next step in your relationship with god and the best way to do that is by shooting us a text to 757-690-2401 let me say that one more time 757-690-2401 that is a church phone number and we love to connect with you there once again, thank you for joining us today at Lifehouse Church. See you next week.